trust is without borders. Let me work upon the waters, wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be much stronger in the presence of my Savior. Upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail, mm-hmm. and there I find you in the mysteries and oceans deep. My faith will stay. Spirit lead me, Spirit lead me, Spirit lead me, take me deeper, take me deeper, take me deeper into you. Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Let me take that down from there. Hey, how are you doing this morning? This is Apostle Sandy Love, and I am glad. I know I had a week off, and um, it was just me and Daddy, and that's what he wanted. That's what I gave him. If you never see me, uh, if I miss a Sunday, I try to tell you in advance, even if I don't tell you the why, but God said he just wanted he wanted to spend some time. I thank God for the, seasons, the season ahead, which is going to put us into a shift. But I'm loving it and anticipating it. But I am glad to be back. And I am excited to do our last few weeks together on the School of the Prophets. And then, booyah, we shift. And that's going to be really exciting. Um, I'm ready. What about you? Let's go into prayer. Father God, I think I'm going to praise you for allowing us to gather here on this morning. I think I'm going to praise you, Father God, for what you're doing and what you're about to do in the lives of your people. And I thank you, Father God, that their labor is not in vain. 
Father God, I ask that as I go through this lesson on today, Father God, that you would open up their hearts to hear what eternity is saying. And Father God, I thank you. The Holy Ghost, you know how we do. You speak and I repeat. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So listen, got a lot to do. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to add that to the stage. And um, th this last part is not really meant to be deep. You may say, well, you know, you did. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you. Look. I understand that y'all not used to people teaching like this because you want to hoop and you want to holler. I, I get it. I'm so sorry because that's not my DNA. I, I am going to be responsible for what I say, what I put out. I'm going to be responsible for, responsible for the integrity by which it is put out. So I'm going to do it the way God told me to be bored, say it's too much, and ain't that deep. <laughs> but when you get in battle, you're going to find out what you have and what you don't have. And there will be no scripts to run up. You can't call prophets love and say, what was you trying to say about so-and-so and so-and-so? It's going to be too late. And that's going to be the truth. But nonetheless, I am going to do my part. Now, the reason I said that or gave that little small dissertation is because Everything that we have done and taught on this prayer from the beginning of the prayer strategy up until now is brought us to prayer templates. You may say, well, I don't I know how to. And this is the problem. The Bible says my people are perishing for the lack of knowledge. You already think, you know, so rock with it. All right. But I'm talking to folks that are tired of praying and not seeing an answer. Because so that's what I get tired of. You keep you're always talking about you pray, you, but you ain't seeing no results and you don't know why. Because you're trying to take nasty attitudes onto the battlefield, all right? You're trying to take unplanned strategies onto a battlefield where you have an enemy waiting for you. And then when you do go and try to go and fast, he comes back with the fury of backlash and you can't figure out why. Sometimes we just got to call some of this stuff to the carpet. But if you want to get some results and you're willing to be taught and retaught in an area that's going to help better you, that's not really called reteaching. It's called just getting an upgrade. It's called being fine-tuned. And so with that being said, that's what all this has been about. These last few weeks, and this will make sense if you kept up with the teaching, it's just application. I'm going to give you a small recap, and then we're going to give you a template. Now, remember, let me just not say remember. Let me just go ahead and move into it. All right. So we're dealing with templates. So today, we look over here to the, um, oh, my P fell down. Over here up on the slide, it says recap. For some reason, the P is over here. Recap. That means I'm going to do a small recap. And then I'm going to deal with the three dimensions of prayer, which were what? Me, intercession, and coming to God as judge, showing you how the courtroom is not some new methodology. With the reason we broke down Pela, the house of prayer, and Ecclesia, uh, the house of judicial and governmental affairs, is so that you would understand that you are coming and being ushered into a governmental atmosphere. And not to understand how to approach this atmosphere is why we're losing. Not to understand your role is why you're losing. So again, let's go ahead and let's get started. So these are templates. The first template is the one today we're dealing with the me and the I. The next one, this will make sense next week, but it's not really food. You just can't put intercessory prayer there. But that's the, the scripture that we're going to come from in Luke. And then coming to God is judge. But first we're going to deal with me. So these are what we're going to deal with. And then we're done. We are out and we are thin eye finish. All right. So now. Let's go ahead and move to an overview. Again, just recap and recap only. <clears throat> um, when I talk about the three dimensions of prayer, I want you to understand I'm not saying, again, because people are so carnal and they look to find fault. We're not saying there are only three ways to pray. What we're saying is there are three dimensions in the spiritual realm that help us to uh, uh, understand how to approach uh, eternity and get the help with that we need. We're either coming on behalf of ourselves, behalf of someone else or a country or whatever the case is, and we are approaching God as father or judge, i.e. one and the same, but we'll get to that in a minute. All right. So let me go ahead. We've, we've taken this long way to lay a clear foundation to help us to become more efficient in prayer. Prayer, as we learn, means pay lot judgment. 
the judgment isn't one that we alone determine. But uh, according to Revelation 10 and 11, says what? I took a small scroll from the angel's hand. Who does the angel work for? Eternity. Who is in eternity? The, the Trinity. So I took, he's saying, I took the scroll from the angel's hand and I swallowed it. And in my mouth, it was sweet as honey. That's how the assignments feel when God is telling us to pray and to be on our post and to be on our guard. But as we begin to eat it, it continues to say, it was sour to my stomach. And listen, then someone said to me, the angel said, you must pray. And let me, let me, let me stop because it says then someone. That could have been the Holy Ghost. OK, it says, and then someone said to me, you must prophesy again to many people, nations, tongues. This is revelation. This is our assignment. Our assignment is to prophesy to kings. And but how are we going to do that if we don't understand the protocol? We I'm so sorry that it's almost as if we came out of slavery in the natural, but still have a slave mentality. If the master don't tell you what to say or to do, you don't know. And I mean pastors. I'm talking about it. Because not every pastor is going to tell you a protocol because we have many hirelings in the body of Christ. But if I'm concerned about you as a leader, my job is to tell you how to approach your God or give you suggestions that would help what work out your salvation to get God's attention. Because listen, tears ain't always doing it because sometimes we crying and we did wrong and you, you don't want to be called on the carpet. But that's another sermon. Let's stay with prayer on the day. Now, let me continue. Thus, the courtroom of heaven is simply a dimension in the spiritual realm where we listen to God um, as he what gives out orders, assigns assignments, and then we learn to work with eternity. That's what Revelation 10 is talking about. I'm only learning to work with eternity. Somewhere we have taken this independent thing as to mean that I'm so-and-so and so-and-so. I can just do what I want. No, fool. You're supposed to work with eternity. The angel gets its assignment from God. The, the whatever prophetic words that are of God that we get come from the Holy Ghost, who is what a part of the strategy mind of the Godhead. They give us the assignment. and It is our job to work with them to know how. So what I'm trying to do is, is that we've been told that we got all this power and authority and we just think we don't need to work with eternity. Then no matter what we do is going to be OK and all right. And it's just not the truth. So this is why we're doing this a full recap. And I'm going to move real fast today. OK. All right, now listen. It says in Isaiah 6, Isaiah 6, 8 through 9. I think we should pull that up. What you think? Don't you? I know, I knew you was gonna feel me. Isaiah 6, and we're gonna go 8 through 9. And I'm gonna read this real quick. I'm, I didn't have it pulled up as you could probably tell. This is what it says. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Let's slow it down. I just said that our assignments come from God. So he says, he's saying, I have an assignment. But listen, who will go for us? Right, now, listen, let's not run by that. Because y'all love that other part that says, then I said, here am I, send me. Now, nah, fool, we're going right back to it says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who can I find? Who can I trust with this assignment? And who is going to go and represent for us? All these names flying around. And Isaiah is saying, who can I send? And who is going to rep us? And then the prophet says, here am I, send me. And verse 9 says, and he said, go to this people. Hear ye, but not understand not. See indeed, but perceive not. You all want to go and give out all these fluff, nice words. And God is saying, I didn't come to be nice. I can't divide. Don't even get me started on that because that's not the topic for this week. <laughs> all right. So let's go on. Let's go back. All right. So and then we have Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. It says, and now we are brothers and sisters in God 
and God's family because of the blood of Jesus. And he welcomes us to come into the most high sanctuary in heavenly places boldly and without hesitation, for he has dedicated a new life, giving us a how to approach God. I don't care how many versions you go and find it, but you need to familiarize yourself with Hebrews uh, 10, 19, and 20, and everything else I'm recapping. There is a way of approach. You didn't just get saved and sit up over there and disrespect him and talk to him like he one of your fools up on the street and in, the, and in your gang. This is saying, listen, we are a part of his family because of what? The blood of Jesus. And he welcomes us to come boldly before the throne of his holy sanctuary. For he has dedicated a life. I'm sorry, a dedicated a new life giving way for us to approach God. Come on now. You can't run up and disrespect him because you disrespect your mama. But we'll get we'll get more into that. Let's continue. He wants you to know that this new dimension or this thing that you're talking about, the courtrooms of heaven, is nothing but the, the mountain of Zion. It is a courtroom. And he's showing you how to approach it in confidence, how to what you did not know and what your pastor did not teach you 10, 15 years ago does not take away from the fact that somebody went into the word of God and dug out that we may not be getting our prayers uh, uh, answered because we're not approaching God in a manner that is getting his attention. If you ever read this book by Frank Peretti called um, Piercing the Darkness, one of the things I thought was I was so fascinated with when I read that probably about the age of 23, 24. And that was the fact that the angels kept telling them, stop backbiting, stop gossiping and pray. But they didn't want to do that. They kept backbiting. They kept gossiping. Of course, the demons were egging them on to do all of that. And every time that they would get into that zone, then they would go and try to pray. Angels would do this. We can't do anything. You lock the hands. You lock the angels' hands when you try to backbite, tear down another man or woman of God in the name of God, and then think you're going to pray in, on behalf of eternity. It doesn't work like that. And you just you, and then you wonder why my prayers are amiss. So now you think that if I get a car or a dress or a house, that this is God and that is the blessing, and that's why you're being deceived because the devil gives out blessings too to make you think it's God. But what he's not telling you is that he's the God that bought you that car because you didn't believe in God. You thought you did it, but that's another conversation. Let's keep going. Got a lot of work to cover. Um, so again, you're qualified to talk to God. I, 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 we got to deal with this right here. You don't understand. I, I, I thought this was interesting on my walk. I'm so used to praying for people or prophesying and ministering to people. But for the last year and a half, maybe even two years, when people would hit me up on Facebook and say, hey, prophetess, can you pray for me? And they, they're coming out of desperation. They're coming out of not knowing because they don't know me. And I, I found myself when I would go to God and I begin to go and pray. He would say, no, you tell them I want to hear their voice. We have created a stigma that tells you that your voice isn't good enough. My prayers don't count. God isn't listening to me. If I don't get to my pastor, it won't get done. If I don't get to the prophet, it's never going to happen. Let me go and pay the seed and get a word. And let me go and do so and so and so and so and it'll be done. And God is saying, where is that in my word? And God is saying, your lack of prayers being answered is because your lack of faith in our relationship. And, and I, I had to tell people, God says, I want to hear your voice. And as I was putting this lesson together, though I could have went straight to the application, he said, no, I need them to understand that I'm waiting to hear their voice. They run into everybody else, but they not running to me. You send everybody else to come and intercede for you, but you're not coming for yourself. He's waiting to hear your voice. Now, what qualifies you right here? Ephesians 2 and 6. For he has raised us up from the moment you got saved and you accepted Christ. Even if you backslid, guess what? God has still does not take salvation away from you. He is still waiting on you to pray. That's why Ephesians 2 and 6 says he raised us up from the dead and seated us in heavenly places because we are united with him. He does not break and divorce you because you divorce him. And we teach that, oh, I fell. I can't go to God. Look at what I did. Where did it say that at? You fell. Repent. Get back up. You don't, use, you don't lose your relationship with him. 
Hebrews 12 and uh, 23. And as members of the church of the firstborn, we're going to come back to this, but the firstborn, when Christ died on that cross, we became the heirs of Christ and we are the firstborn. And our names are legally, listen, registered as citizens of heaven. He didn't take your citizenship away because you sinned. And the reason we're having problems in the prayer department is because the more you go in there with this boldness and knowing who you are, this is why you're getting sometimes the backlash you're getting. Because the enemy doesn't want you to know what you possess. And so for, for some of you experts, this teaching was over your head or you found fault with it. It don't take all that. But then you crying on my shoulder and want me to come and pray for you. But if you was listening to what I was saying, we was feeding your spirit for the next season because we knew you were going to come across something that you weren't ready for. And I'll say this one more time in the military. Though we go through basic training does not mean that's the last time we get training. You're upgraded every six months to every year, every year and a half. Now, no, you're going to be upgraded every six months. Six to eight months, you're going to be upgraded or shown some new weapon and learn how to use it, be trained in something new. But only in the church do we get to this place in God where we feel like we know everything. We don't need no more teaching and we don't need no more help. And that becomes a problem. All right, let's keep going. He was 12 and 23 as members of the church of the firstborn, uh, firstborn, all, all of our names had been legally registered as citizens in heaven. And we can come before God who judges all and who lives among the spirits of the righteousness. Luke 22 and 28, you are the ones who have stood by me in my trial. This is, this is uh, Jesus talking to his disciples. And I bestow on you a kingdom as my father. In other words, you was there with me. Come to his disciples. You shared in the crucifixion, so to speak. You walked with me. You saw my tears. You tried to pray. You tried to understand. And because you were there with me, I bestow upon you a kingdom because my father bestowed one. And, I, and we already taught this word. This is where he says, I confer unto you a kingdom, not bestow. The word bestow means to confer. Confer is a contractual term to say, I am willing you this authority. I am willing you. I ain't got to die yet. He, was, he wasn't dead. But I am pre-willing this to you that upon my death, you will get up in the resurrection of my name. You will walk in my authority and you will do that which I have done. Why? Because my daddy gave it to me and I am giving it unto you. And if you're listening up under the sound of my voice, this is the authority that you are missing when you go into prayer because you do not know who you are. But let's not finish. He says, verse 30, and that you may eat and drink at my table. Listen to me. And in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the, listen, let's, let's, let's put it in perspective. You can come and eat at my table. Not when you get to heaven, because he's, he's, he's everlasting. He's eternal. Anytime you want to come and sup with me, I'm there. 2 a.m. in the morning, 11.30 in the morning, call on my name and I promise I'll come and we can eat together. And I'll put you on thrones, thrones denote authority, positions, putting you in a place where you can see how to govern and, and govern my people. That's why Zechariah 3, 6, and 7 is so important. He was giving them, uh, Zechariah was given a precursor of what Christ came and fulfills right here in Luke. Let's keep going. That's the basics. Now, let's talk about battlefield transparency. First, let's define it. The term battlefield, trans, or trans, excuse me, transparent battlefield, it refers to the concept in military operations where advanced technology is utilized to improve situation awareness and provide real-time information about the battlefield and the stakeholders, including the soldiers, commanders, and decision makers. Well, where do you get this from, Robert? A couple of weeks ago, um, God had me, to, no, it's been a bright bottom line now. God had me share a testimony. And I remember the next morning I woke up and he says, tell them to understand uh, battlefield tra or transfer, uh, 
transparent battlefield or battlefield transparency, I think is really how you put it. And 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 I and, and trying to explain this is crazy because we just so deep now. And what he was saying was this: How did you overcome, Sandy, by the blood, the blood of Christ and our, our testimony? And we're gonna get to that a little bit. He's saying, listen. Everything we have gone through collectively, as we begin to share it one with another, as we begin to bear our scars and stop trying to act like we ain't walking through nothing and that we're, we, we're making it through everything. These are the transparent moments that I can share with another brother or sister of how I survived divorce, how I survived domestic violence, how I um, survived um being homeless or not having an education. How did I survive? I'm giving you the testimony of the battlefield to do what? Listen, to advance. In other words, my information, my survival is the information or the advanced technology that you need because you don't have it. You don't know it because you ain't been through it. So when I come back and I sit over here and I pour out into you or I'm pouring out through a teaching, any teaching, not just mine, any teaching that's going to help you to better yourself, it is advanced technology to do what? Utilize to improve situation. What's the situation? The battlefield. You're taking the, you're taking the technology you didn't know about, the testimonies. The weapons that were used, the way that they were used, and you are taking them onto the situational battlefield to give you awareness and give you real-time information about what's going on on the battlefield. And listen, it's not just benefiting you, but it is benefiting the stakeholders, including the commanders and those that sit in the Department of Defense and can get the and get the information and know how to strategically plan. There's always a decision maker or strategist behind the scenes, and their job is to give you the information in real time because they're not on, they, the generals are not on the battlefield. So they have to rely on the testimony from the battlefield or, or the things that went wrong on the battlefield to shift. This is called transparent battlefield or battlefield transparency. I probably am going to flip that back around, but that's how I wrote it. So we'll leave it there. Get this. That's all this is about. If I was somebody big name, all y'all be eating it up. But the problem, you know what the problem is? When it's in the book and it starts selling for trillions and thousands of dollars, and people have me come signing up, what you reject for free, you'll pay and stand in the line and pay the thousands. So thank you in advance for the rejection, but for the acceptance, finally, of having to pay the hundreds for it. Not being smart, I'm being honest, because this is why you're dying, because you're looking for your survival or your whatever to come from Bishop Jakes or, or uh, Shukabuka Baka. But you don't see that your healing is coming in the hand of a maid. And that's why Naaman kind of felt some kind of way, because it didn't, the prophet didn't get down and honor him. The fact that the maid even told you, you should have been happy, but he wasn't. But nonetheless, let's keep going. All right. Now, so again, here, testimony is powerful. Revelations 12 and 11. I'm not going to go through. You already know the story. I'm just give that's the high point. Um, yeah. So you get it. Uh, Christ's testimony is our testimony. What he has done for us, how he kept us and how he saved us. So we're overcoming by the, his blood and his testimony of overcoming. And as we accept that, then guess what happens? We now, because he's brought us through, now have a testimony of what he has done in us and for us. And we can share that. And guess what? We're supposed to pass it on to help you on the battlefield. So your testimony is the advanced technology that can help somebody else in their situation. So keep shutting up. Don't tell nobody. Guess what? You ain't helping nobody. And therefore, you have no victory. And nobody else will have any victory because you're locked up with information that could help people. But you're too embarrassed to tell your story. All right, now, here we go. Let's get to the application. I'm going to tell you I'm going to move fast. Again, we talked about the three dimensions of prayer. 
there is the the father seeing God as father, or I call it the me the me I stage, and then we have the intercessory prayer, and those that intercede on behalf of others. Now I remind you, you could intercede on behalf of a nation, a friend, a family member. It doesn't matter. Intercession is intercession, and then the last one, you're approaching the. Um, you're approaching uh, the, the courtroom as God, as God judge, meaning that one sense you're approaching God as father. Uh, the second one, you're approaching God as um, interceding on behalf of somebody else. And the third is that you're approaching God as the judge and they all have their place. And those are the dimensions. There is no in between. And when you really think about it, you're either coming to God about yourself, about somebody else or something you want him to do, which is still the judge part of God. That's what means it's uh, in the spiritual realm of dimensions. But again, I understand. It's a shame that I was raised up under dogmatic ministries and and, and they would always say stuff like, well, the pastor said, and the pastor said, and the pastor said. And I remember thinking one day, well, he didn't really say that. I mean, Jesus is the one that said it. But as I got older, I began to understand that if it's not your pastor that says it, you don't want to receive it. And then when they fall and brought to an open shame, then you devastate it. But you never understood that the Bible says we have many teachers, we have many instructors, but not many fathers. Never dis you're not you're not disrespecting your spiritual mother or father because you heard um, Bishop so and so give a good sermon and it was good in your spirit and you ate it. Why would your leader be mad about that? But then again, some leaders are mad when you eat other places because they feel like it's disrespectful to them. But what does the Bible say? Because hmm? when Christ came, they was eating from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of that. And yet he interrupts time and says, they're wrong. Come after me. So you have to know when God is talking from a personal relationship and trying to add some new weapons to your um, arsenal so that you can be perfected. So is God... Going to get mad at you because you're eating teaching that you didn't know from Prophet of Sandy? You, 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 you can't eat from me because your pastor said so and so and so and so. You better work out your salvation, but you're going to find, you're going to figure it out. You're going to figure it out. All right. So let's go dive right into the dimensions of prayer. Now, I call this uh, the, the, the flesh approach. Um, but here's why. Let me just go ahead and read it. This is Luke 11. And he said to me, when you pray, say, Father, how will be thy name, thy kingdom come? Let's, let's break this down. Number one, always respect God. Um, I, 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 I don't know what that means because I'm learning that respect means different things to different people. But can I say this? Don't walk up in my house and don't speak and go in my refrigerator because I'm, I'm, I'm putting you out after I hit you upside the head. I'm sorry. It's disrespectful. Just because it's your father, you know, or you don't have the words to say whatever, whatever you want to tell yourself, at least say, pray this prayer. If you, it, that's what I think Christ was really saying if you don't know what to say, you don't have the words, all the formality that they were telling them what to do. And it was a lot. He was trying to keep it simple, just basically, basically saying, honor your father. He's waiting to hear from you. So, Father God, I come, hallowed be the name, praise and worship unto your name. Give us this day our daily bread. So I call this the flesh zone because most of the time when we're dealing with prayer, and I want to make sure I, I say this right. I'm not saying the prayer is, is, is fleshly. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying this is the father part or the daddy side of God. This is the side where we flesh approach him in our flesh. So he's not flesh. Don't misunderstand. But this is the stage where it's, God, I want this. God, I want that. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Can I have, can I have, can I get a car? Can I get a man? Can I get a marriage? Can I get a wife? Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? And then bless everybody else. That's why I call this the flesh stage. But it's also in this stage where you get to pour your heart out to God without judgment. Because why? He is your father. And that's what Christ was trying to get them to understand. He really is your father. He's not waiting for you to come in such a way or give such an approach, but come on, let him know how you, he's waiting. 
to talk to you. That's why I say we are running to everybody but our daddy. Why do I have to come to you to talk to my daddy? This is what they were doing. Oh, my God. Like, we really try to act like we're not Pharisees and Sadducees in this generation. Then why I got to come to you to get prayer? Why I got to come through somebody to get prayer? No. Christ was saying, you got all these different religions telling you, and, and God is saying, come to me yourself. You don't know what to say or pray? Here's a model for you. Here's a template for you. Translation, talk to your father the way you feel. I suggest, depending upon a topic and how old you get here, this is how Paul said it. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child I was immature. I didn't understand nothing about no approach. I didn't understand about nothing. I just rolled up up in there and was talking to, to the G because, you know, that's what we do. Nothing is wrong with that, okay? Let me, let me clarify it. Nothing is wrong with that. But Paul says, but when I got older and I got a little bit more mature and I began to understand really, really who he was, not just in my mind, but in the world, as he unveiled himself to me, I began to put some speck on his name. I began to respect him more. Wanted to understand how to approach him. Wanted to understand how I should move. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. But it is also here that you can say what it is you want. I know there are moments when you're going through a trial because I've gone through there too. You're going through a trial and what begins to happen is that, um, yes, it's working on her. What begins to happen is that uh, so much is going on and, and you don't want to be proper. And you just want to say, look, this is what hurt me. This is what they did. I don't like it. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, it's right there that you have a right to tattletale, come as you are, have a temper tantrum, complain, whatever, 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 but you can build a relationship, uh, your discipleship, everything that happens, it begins with the father role. And I didn't have a father. So this was hard for me. It was hard for me to understand God's role as father because everybody kept saying, well, you know, he's like a father. You never had it. Well, well that only made no sense. But I've never had a father or had an abusive father or one that molested me. Now, I don't think I want to see God in that light. And he's none of those. And no matter what worldly connotation we try and put on his name, it doesn't do him justice. But what I will say is this. Come to him as you are and learn of him. And then as you learn of him, this is why this is an approach. Knowing when to come to him. Now, that's one reason. Another reason this is important is because... As I mentioned, um, that so we have the immature way, and then we had the growth way of approach. This approach I'm talking about right now was I want to get myself cleaned up. I want you to discipleship me. I, I, I know you want me to be an intercessor. I know you're calling me to go before nations and to pray for them, but I got some things that I need to bring to you that are like I can't talk about to nobody else. And I need to have this conversation with you. All of this is in that me stage, in that I stage. Everything I'm talking about fits in this area if you're listening to me flip and shift, but I'm saying the same thing. There is no holes bar in here. There is no right and wrong in here. The difference is where you are when you first meet him to when you grow in him, excel in him, mature in him, and then become an expert in him. And I use that word loosely, but just for right purposes, because at some point you grow up from the me and the my and what I want to, what can I do for the kingdom? How can I serve you? What's my next order? How do you want me to carry it out? Let's talk about this type thing. So, so these are all different levels. All of them are still coming to the father is what I want you to see. Whatever the role and dimension, whatever the level of the lack thereof, everything that you want to deal with is about coming to the father about things that concern you in your relationship with him. All right. So that's why we're breaking these areas down. This week, we're only talking about the father role, how we go to him and how we can go to him no matter how we feel. All right. Now, now here's a here's a template. And then I'm going to give you an example. Uh, we approach God with respect. I talked about that. Now, let me tell you, let's combine some scripture here to the best of my ability. Where's my book at? Did I bring it? I may have to get up and get it, so just bear with me if I jump up and you see me move. <laughs> the reason this is important is because 
I'm not talking to the baby Christian right now. I'm not talking to the one that's looking to understand God right now because all of these can still go in here. But I'm talking to the person that's saying, God, I really that they God, I really want you to use me more. I've learned a little bit. I'm trying to learn some more. And I know that they keep telling me that your word is powerful and to keep you in remembrance of your word. And I also know that when I go into battle, I need word because because your word is the weapon that uh, locks up the enemy, so to speak, or that keeps him at bay. And my angels respect and honor your word. So sometimes when we tell you and I was the same way, so I'm, I'm trying to be really honest here and help somebody. Everybody doesn't sit down and read the Bible and memorize scripture. Sometimes we learn it because we study it enough. And so one of the things that um, I want you to, to, to understand is that this is what God told me years ago. He says, I don't expect you to memorize all of the scriptures, but I want you to find just a few that you know you can ponder on and take in and use them in, in war or use them, uh, make use of them in certain situations. So that's what I'm going to tell you the same thing he told me. So, so when I'm coming to him in prayer, I'm not trying to show off. And, and, and remember, when you don't know scripture, then you don't use scripture because he doesn't want you to come like that. What I'm talking about is you maturing God as a leader and you need to approach him a certain way. And there is an honesty that comes in this realm, but there's another level of honesty where you need to go and do your work. And I'm gonna give you an example of what I mean. So right here, the first one is the approach with respect. Uh, there, there's a Hebrews 10 and 19, remember, you gotta remind him. So if I'm coming, I'm reminding him that I'm a citizen of God. I don't approach him acting like it's all good. One of the first things I do after I acknowledge who he is and, th and, and, and thank him for breathing. I thank him. I start repenting for my sins of the day or week. Then I go into, this is what's on my mind. Let me go ahead and present my case. Okay. Um, presenting my case comes from Isaiah 43 and 26, where it says, come, let us reason together, says the Lord, and to argue your case. So go look up these scriptures. Um, in other words, what does it mean present your case? What's, why are you really here? When you get done telling me about who messed you over and what they did, give me your case so we can come and figure this thing out. Because you're talking to your dad and it's the father stage here. So he said, come on, bring it. I'm not going to judge you, but bring and tell me your case. All right. Then it says, let's submit yourselves to God, James 4 and 7. Submit yourselves means that while you're in this prayer, you're saying to God, I'm going to submit my mind, body, soul, and spirit into this prayer time that we're in for guidance, for leading, whatever the case is. Now, this one I need to show you because um, I know not everybody likes to talk about this, but we're going to talk about it. We got to go to Daniel 7 and 10. Because remember, I started out saying in this in this beginning, it's all about the approach. Now I'm going to read it. Okay. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him. And 10,000 times, 10,000 stood before him. And the judgment was set. And the books were open. No matter what version you read this in, but take the simplest one that you can find. What you begin to find out is that um, the courtroom, Daniel is having a vision. The, before this verse, he's having a vision of the different, uh, the, the different parts of kingdoms that will arise and what they're going to do and how they're going to flow. But then he turns around and he has this interception of a vision, meaning as if he's watching this clay the head, the clay, the, the, which were the feet, bronze, gold, and silver. And these are different kingdoms arising. And this is just a dream or a vision. But in the middle of the vision, he sees like this, like the foot coming into time and stepping into it and taking his seat. He is watching eternity. In other words, he's seeing all this stuff that's going to happen and what they're going to do. But eternity steps into time and into the vision and says, now let me show you how we work. 
He's getting a glimpse of something. So when you look at this and then you go and then, because people say, oh, this is not in the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. But, but remember, your slave masters didn't teach you this because they didn't know it. So now you mad. <laughs> so in Zechariah, when it says, I'll give you a place amongst these standing here and you will what rule and govern over my house, church, um, courtroom of heaven, the courts, you see talking about, and then amongst them standing here, that deals with death. Oh, y'all ain't ready for me. So you have a role to play, but the enemy got you caught up in um, Housewood, Hollywood, Hollywood house, Housewives, Basketball Club. It's got you caught up in all this superficial stuff because that's how you wind down, that you can't hear the things of God. You can't see them. It's too deep. It ain't that deep. I ain't got time. Boy, but you got time for love and hip hop. So Daniel is having an encounter with eternity. And when you're in prayer and you get done acknowledging who he is, you get done telling God, I come boldly before the throne. I'm coming to hear what you want to say to me after you empty out and repent. Um, I submit to your handiwork. Now, God, if you allow me, I come not on my behalf, but I come, in fact, listen, I come in the name of Jesus. I come not knowing what to say, but I come boldly before your throne, the, which is the courtrooms of heaven. And I'm asking that you would hear my case. Um, next on, on the number two side, it says, answer your adversary, Hebrews 12 and 24. This means that every time you go to God, matter of fact, you ain't even got to go to God. When you are not, every time you don't pray, not praying, thinking about praying, if you do anything wrong, the devil is there trying to accuse you. All right. And this is going to make sense in a minute. Um, you express your request, but, and, and, and I'm trying, I'm sorry, express your request what you desire, but with scripture. Remember, it is scripture that he he understands. Let me say this. Yes, I do understand that the Bible has been manipulated. It has been tainted with, I am very much aware, but to the best of your ability, take what you know to God and ask him for the revelation. He knows your heart. This is for not, what I'm talking about right here is not for baby Christians. Y'all come as you are. I'm talking about skilled leaders that want to see God move in their territories, to move in their cities, to revivals. You must approach in a certain manner because you are, you're coming to him as your father, but you're coming to him as your strategist. You're, thank you, Holy Ghost. You're coming to him to get the strategy, the strategic mind of God. So as you shift from father, how you come in, be ready to deal with the strategist because you're coming for what direction, but it's still coming from what your father. Let's go to this thing. Let's go to Ezra nine and eight. I put this on here too. As I was doing the lesson, um, he took me back here and I forgot all about it. Like, I guess he wanted me to let you all know in Ezra nine and eight. Um, we didn't go a lot into the restraining order, um, but let me, let me, let me just slow it down. Let me read this. Ezra uh, nine, I think, let me sure I got the, uh, it was right. Yeah. Nine and eight, Ezra nine and eight. And now for a little space grace, get used to this term, make, just go back and read the context of it all. But it says, and now for a little space grace has been showed from the Lord, your God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in the holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little revi reviving in our, or relieving, let me just use the word, relieving in our bondage. Let me try to just historically real quick before time runs out. Listen to me. They had, they were rebuilding the walls. They were coming back. They were getting everything reset up because the temple had been told, oh, utterly destroyed. Solomon is gone. The kingdoms are divided and they are left with a mess. And so Nehemiah and Ezra come together. And once the king, once everything is rebuilt, they're now trying to reestablish the law and get people in order. Well, what had happened was the leadership, not the people, the leadership started taking wives and marrying them. 
And God tells Ezra and shows Ezra what is happening and what needs to get done. They're trying not to be cursed all over again. All right. So God says, I'm going to give them space grace. Okay. Space grace is just that it's space with grace. All right. But I thought the term was unusual. And so the reason I'm using this term is because normally I use where um, God will give a restraining order. And that restraining order is what basically is keeping the enemy at bay. Okay. And so instead of using the restraining order for, for time, and I don't want to break all that down. We've already done that. But it's in your prayer time sometimes when you're talking with God that you need to say, God, you know, I know I'm not doing what I need to do. And, and I know you've called me to do, to take this city, to reach this demographic of people. I'm asking for some space, Grace. Give me time to prepare. Let me prep. Let me see. Let me seek you. Let me fast. This is that space, Grace. Okay. Now, I know. Now we got to put this in application. So what I did was to make this make sense. Um, in my school, when we do this, this is part of what they have to go through as well. Again, that's why you're getting School of the Prophets. So all this is in my School of the Prophets. And so um, it, they have to write um, three different prayers from three different dimensions. One dealing with approaching God as father, meaning that there's an issue going on with you. Then they have to learn how to uh, approach things by whether in intercession, meaning that interceding on behalf of a city, a nation, or somebody else. And then number three, they have to learn how to write a prayer in accordance to approaching God as being judged. All right? So... Let me go ahead and get this together for you. Give me a minute, okay? Just give me a quick minute. All right, all right, all right. There we go. Sorry about that. I need. I was hearing noises, and I'm down in the office by myself, so I wanted to make sure nobody else was coming in. But nonetheless, that was a good commercial. Um, heads up, I'm only going to mention it because the video played. <laughs> but Healing Wounded Eagles, our website is just about complete, and we will be advertising for our women's retreat for 2025. I'm just trying to figure out where I want to do it. And uh, we'll talk more about that. So, yes, I am excited about what God is doing. All right, now, to take all these, to take this to this week's application uh, on how to approach God as Father, or meaning the come as you are phase, I need, I had to pick a topic. I had several I wanted to pick. Um, prayers, I mean, 
but I want to go ahead and see what it sounds like. This is not about sound and repetition and, and, and all that stuff. It's just trying to show you how to help you gauge. So you'll hear my honesty. You'll hear, this is, I wrote this. You'll hear my honesty. You'll hear what scriptures I use. And then sometimes I don't even use the scripture. Why? Because I'm just speaking out of the heart. Okay. But what I'm at, what I'm talking to God about is to restore unto me authority, taking back my authority and dominion. And I want you, as you listen to this prayer, that as a believer, the more at one point you don't understand your authority. And then as we walk with God, you do begin to understand your authority. So there's nothing wrong when you don't, when you haven't realized that you haven't been walking in it to go back to God and say, man, I didn't, I didn't understand. I'm so sorry. This is that I stage. I'm coming to him as father. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do this off read without looking at you is what I'm really trying to say. All right. Let me put it where I can see it. All right. Here we go. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they do abominable deeds. This is none. There is none who does good, according to Psalms 14 and 1. Father, for you are God, and besides you there is no other. You existed before the beginning and began before the beginnings. And thus why, who is man, that you should even be mindful or consider him to be anything? Thank you. Before the ages of our existence, you had a plan too lofty for us to comprehend and too complex for mortal man to perceive. Thus, I approach the courtroom with all reverence and adoration. Okay, I'm stopping. You hear what I'm doing? I'm giving him honor. I'm giving him praise. I'm just doing the little stuff. This is now. This ain't for you because I am. I am a poet by nature. So this is this is how I talk. So if you don't talk this way, it's okay. You, you know what I mean. So just you'll get it. All right, let's go. I take not this moment in time and eternity for granted. Thus I walk only upon the shed blood of your son and the finished work of the cross in which your son, Jesus Christ, died. I'm giving, I'm give, still giving adoration, and he is our savior and our advocate. I ask that the courts be seated according to Daniel 7 and 10. I also ask that the accuser, that's this part about the accuser who has come before to bring charges against me. Okay, that's all back in past teachings, but just listen. I also ask that the accuser of the brethren would come. Why am I doing that? Because he has to come before God anytime a case has been presented. And he also came when he wanted to uh, 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 ask God to try Job. So I know what I'm saying and I am aware of what I'm doing. And because of the topic at hand, I'm also taking a stand and making a declaration. Okay, let's go. I ask that the courts be seated according to Daniel 7 and 10. I also ask that the accused of the brother come, the one which brought me before these same courts in times past, when in my ignorance and guilt was fresh and true. I ask Jesus Christ to stand as my advocate in this season. I ask for the Procratic agents, these are angels of eternity, and all of the angelic hosts who are assigned, who are assigned to my destiny to be summoned. I ask that those who have trained and walked before me and who have prayed for me come and partake of this moment as character witnesses this day. This is according to Hebrews. Remember, we talked about the firstborn and the right and how the witnesses of the angels. I am calling my legal aid to come because of the seriousness of the prayer. OK, so this is not for every level that we talked about, but for the serious of the topic. This is so I know what I'm saying, basically. All right. I ask for the scribes to be summoned with their pen in hand to record all that shall be transcribed this day. Now, Father, as we gather here in this place, I come asking for forgiveness of not just my sin, but my iniquities known and unknown. I come admitting that in times past, my adversary was right in bringing charges against me for abandoning my post, according to Matthew 5 and 25. I admit that my zeal and my self-righteousness were the cause of presumptuous actions within my sinful nature. Despite the truth that your grace and mercy were being extended to me, 
I still failed to maintain the highest of your standard. Thus, I stand before this courtroom naked and not ashamed, repenting of silent proclivities, embellished desires, unspoken thoughts contrary to your nature. Forgive me for even disrespecting all authority from my past, which have set negative repercussions uh, toward my life. I repent for relinquishing my dominion and authority. I repent for my silence. I repent for stopping, stalling, giving excuses to find reasons not to go any further in dealing with your people. I repent for listening to the voices of men who sought to kill my mission, my integrity, and my vision. I repent for not cultivating what spiritual mothers and mentors deposited in me in a timely manner. I repent for not walking in the authority bestowed upon me. I repent for looking for not I repent for looking for a blueprint of men, a men to model kingdom affairs. Let me say that again. I repent for looking for a blueprint of men to model kingdom matters after. I repent for not walking in my Samuel anointing. I repent for dumbing down my authority to make men comfortable as if they called me. I repent for speaking contrary to myself, allowing the enemy to think that I'd permit him to steal my destiny at the expense of my own tongue. Forgive me for not perceiving my consecration in the days of my youthfulness, allowing this fallen accuser here today to convince me that rejection was my portion, as if your favor had forsaken me. Father, I remember the days when no one looked on me with pity and had compassion enough to even do any of the things that you have done for me. It was you that gathered me when I was thrown into the open field on the day I was born and despised, according to Ezekiel 16, 5 through 6. Forgive me for coveting their voices in obscure moments, uh, in seasons, instead of standing on my own right and dominion in you. I repent before you in all of eternity, for I have not represented you well. So forgive me, eternity. Thus, I throw myself on eternity's courtroom and upon this altar. I am asking that you hear my case and judge my heart. And if there be any guile, then do with me as you did Isaiah. Touch my lips with coal until I am purged and I yield to you even the more. For it is written that before you formed me in the womb, you knew me before I was born and set apart, appointing me as a prophet to the nations. But like Lazarus, you called me by name, calling me even from the dead clothes of the fall, my fallen nature. Those you predestined, you also called. Those you called, you also justified, and those you justified, you glorified. You said that in the last days that you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and I am your daughter, whom you granted the ability to prophesy and to dream, according to Joel 2 and 28. I come asking for the full restoration of my authority back. I stand as Joshua did in the presence of those assembled here, according to Zechariah 3, when Satan, the accuser who also accused me, but nevertheless, I am asking that a restraining order that Satan ordered be revoked in Jesus' name over my authority, my life, and my mission. I am asking that these same orders be revoked on those in my last assignment who fell under the demonic influence. I am asking that the new restraining order be permitted upon my accuser until the duration of my lifespan, which is an injunction. And if my seed follow in my way, that this order would remain permanent. So that means if they don't follow in my way, then they don't get that blessing. And he will not hinder them as they walk in their God-given authority. Father, I understand that Satan has a mission. However, I ask that this restraining order serve uh, as it did your servant Joshua and Zechariah 3, whom you called to judge in the house and within your courtrooms. I also ask that I ask for a full adjudication 
in my favor for the lost wages of inheritance, all that had been stolen from me, all that had been raped and even sifted away due to the forms of witchcraft, including word curses, slander, altar sacrifices, and more. I asked for a full restoration and, the, and every filibuster to be reversed and, and reversed in my favor this day. I asked for apostolic wealth and philanthropist management according to Leviticus 8 and in alignment with the Abrahamic covenant. I asked for the financial holdups in the spiritual room to be lifted and um, any unseen or unknown curses or restraining orders to be broken and revoked in Jesus' name. Thus, the Supreme Court of Heaven, I decree and declare the following. I take my apostolic dominion back. I take back my authority according to Isaiah 6, 8 through 9. Who can send me? Who can send me? Send me and I will represent eternity. I decree and declare that my authority is your authority and my words are your words and my character displays eternity in eternity alone. I decree and declare, according to Psalms 127 and 1, that as you continue to build the house on earth and through the inhabitants of the sphere, I shall remain a watchman and continue to awaken and to cry out aloud and spare not. I decree and declare that as I walk in my full, restored, uncompromised authority was sold unto me, that I will stand for the brand of eternity. I submit this school, School of the Prophets, and other visions back, all visions back to you so that you in return can breathe and instruct them back into this vessel yet again. And I shall continue birthing out into 14 generations, prophetic foundations, as long as it is needed and my seed shall continue to do the same. I shall decree and declare that the school, the school of the prophets will serve as your vision and purpose only. I decree that every student in current and future attendance will be drawn by the Holy Spirit alone and will come to hungry and ready to eat. I thank you for every instructor who teaches that they will see what the vision is. Uh, that the vision has nothing to do with me, but it's everything to do with their purpose in following you. God, I have yielded my heart upon this court, and I thank you for hearing me and close your in, in hearing me and close in the following manner. Thank you for hearing my case before all standing here and all parties who rest now, but who uh, but who've helped me when they have shined. I say thank you past mentors that helped me. Even the accuser and his minions say, it is good that I was afflicted. Now I, that, that I was afflicted, uh, had I not then what I have not known now that you are my God on every level. And I have learned how to dethrone, um, the throne the enemy effectively with eternity's help. Thus, with authority fully restored, Satan, the Lord, rebukes you. So I'm not trying to do it in myself. I'm just following protocol that's already set in the Bible. I am asking that the court scribes place the verdict of this court, dispatch it to them all needed upon regions of my sphere, meaning everything I am assigned to according to the, the authority that God has given me. Let it be proof that Satan is defeated and that the seal of eternity's approval rests upon my apostolic scepter to me. Come on now. This authority will be respected and Satan and all of hell must become subject to it. Satan's orders are revoked immediately from all parties effectively immediately and our restraining orders are revoked, um, are invoked upon him as he relates to my kingdom agenda as you did with Samuel. To the Pocratic ages of eternity, my angelic guards, teach me how to work with you so that the kingdom work is accomplished. And I thank you for the verdicts found in my favor and these items or issues that have come before the courtroom this day. I thank you for the case set before you on the grounds of an adjudication and all of the co other courts which need to be notified. I understand God and I say thank you. Thank you for hearing me in Jesus name. And yes, I surrender. When you get time, I want you to, in Jesus' name, amen. That is not something I prayed then. It is my continual prayer. And even reading it today and this morning brings back the same reasons I still stand on it. 
you have to get to a place where you take your authority back. You have to get to a place where you recognize that you have abandoned your post more times than you can count. You have to repent and say, God, I'm ready to own all of it without complaint and without compromise. I'm sorry. And then follow script as you need to. All right. That is our lesson for today. Told you we right at that hour mark. And I thank you for tuning in and joining. Father God, I ask that as they go back and they listen to this lesson, that it would be beneficial to their spirit and their soul and that they will get something from it and that their eyes would be awakened in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. well, this is Apostle Prophetess Sandy Love and have a blessed day.